Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this artist talk. I'm Chrissy Isles, and I'm Joel Aaron Krantz, curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And I'm delighted to be on this panel today where we're discussing the work of Constant Dallart, um, wonderful artist who's also, uh, whose work can be seen also in the fair. Um, we're going to sort of basically all introduce ourselves and um, Matt Gerzen to, to my right um, too, where we'll both be discussing with Constant his work. Um, and what we're going to do is Constant's going to give a presentation of his work. I'm going to make a few remarks, maybe putting it to more sort of historical, um, a little bit of a historical context, and Matt is going to talk about his work and research in relation to um, the issues brought up in Constant's work, and then there'll be an opportunity for some um, Q&A. So welcome, and welcome Constant and Matt. Uh, thank you. So my name is Constant Dullard. Oh, and there's a first slide. Um, so I'll give you like a brief introduction to the work, at least how I ended up uh, making the work that's in the focus section right now. Um, so general, I think the fascination with buying attention, right? Like buying quantified attention, so buying followers. And uh, my personal belief is that social media is promoting the fear of being left alone. So it's um, the idea that you want to quantify the attention, hoard the attention that you might get for something by seeing the numbers of people that might follow you or be interested in your images. And I was getting interested in that more and more. So um, with the research um, that I did, I started to just buy some followers. And this was on Instagram. And it was quite weird because I tricked myself in thinking that I was a better person because I had more followers, even though I had purchased them. And they were, of course, fake. But I still thought I was a better version of myself. Um, and uh, I was also starting to look at like the details, how these followers were crafted. So a lot of these followers were um, made to look like people, but with um, obvious mistakes. And this was, for example, generation of followers that doesn't exist anymore. So current followers that are crafted don't have these induced spelling mistakes. But I thought these spelling mistakes were wonderful because for example, Yerden here is into spirituality instead of spirituality. Um, but I was also interested in the fact that they, how they were cropping their pictures, because at that time, so this is 2014, four years ago, um, there was Instagram forced square images. So I thought it was quite interesting that kind of important moments in people's lives that they wanted to share with their friends ended up with heads being cropped off and strange ha hashtags. So for example, I never knew that you could uh, snowboard a marathon, uh, like in this picture. Um, you know, especially like if you've been in the army and you want to reminisce about your time in the army and then you crop off both of your heads, I thought that was kind of strange, a strange thing to do. Um, so this is a few more of these um, profiles. Um, I really love this and I always wanted the, this to be the tagline of my, um, like next to my name, I like it be fancy. I think that's a really good motto to live by. Um, so, and again, like if you look at like contemporary fake followers and contemporary social fluff, as I would describe it, they would already look much different uh, than, than these profiles. Um, but these induced, uh, these induced textual errors, I think, are quite interesting because it would avoid uh, people from finding their own bios. So it would be bios that would be scraped or texts that would be scraped and then intentionally added errors um, with a piece of software so people couldn't find or research their own profiles or their own texts. And I thought that was also quite interesting in a way of dealing with and appropriating other people's content. Um, and of course now the main topic is that a lot of these things and these identities are, you can discuss it in which sense they're stolen, so in which sense they're compiled or they're appropriated by of other people and which these identities might, you know, uh, spoof another person's identity. So that becomes usually problematic. This is still my favorite, uh, John Allen. John Allen says, I'll prove to the world that I would e-come some hin important to they ned someday. I think John Lynn um, is quite interesting. 
Um, but then uh, I thought, like, what to do with these followers? And there's like a lot of people that would, you know, seek a certain um, validation of their art practice by having this kind of quantified social capital. So I was looking at people that were doing that, and I saw this man's uh, profile that recently started on Instagram. So he was quite young. He didn't have the amounts of followers that I thought he would, you know, deserve because his, he's been he has quite a decent track record in the art world. Um, and his reception on Instagram was still, yeah, a bit meager. Um, and I thought, like, I have the power to, you know, to be gracious. And um, same as for this, this person, or for this person. And I thought, like, you know, these numbers that they're different, um, it's problematic because it induce some, induces some kind of social competition. And what, how do I find possibilities within this material? If I can purchase it, why can't I appropriate it as an artistic material? Um, so what I did is that I uh, gave these followers away. So for example, I made sure that this uh, young man in the, that runs this profile had 100,000 followers. Um, and for example, this person who started with 21,000 followers also got 100,000 followers, or Simone de Brie also was upgraded to 100,000 followers. So this is Richard Prince again. He got 100,000 followers for me. Ai Weiwei thought it was also more interesting if he would be you know, equal to these other people and there would be less competition because I thought within the art world it's so distracting if you have this kind of quantified difference, right? Like you already have like art market and prices, then why do you also need that with an audience? So, I equalize them to each other. Um, Petra Courtright, Raffman, you know, friends and foes, you know. And um, in the end, I thought it was interesting that even these profiles, because they're crafted and I could appropriate them to even exhibit them. But then a crucial thing happened for me um, that I was on the phone and I got an interview with somebody from New York Times and they were interested in, the, in, the art, in, in Instagram and how I use it in my art practice, but they were mostly interested in how it influenced my market price and how much I had sold through Instagram. And I was kind of explaining that it was much more a critique of how it worked and that I was kind of wanting to resist this kind of um, quantified social capital and this kind of competition. And, um, and the strange thing was that in the end, the article didn't, like my work didn't make it to the article, that was fine, but uh, the follower numbers of Simone de Puri and Ai Weiwei were quoted in the article to validate their artistic practice. So for example, Simone de Puri, who has 120,000 followers on Instagram, says this about Instagram, where I was like, that's crazy because I bought the guy 30,000 followers. <laughs> so, and it's also strange because I'd proven to the journalist and I sent the, the names of these uh, of the people that I'd influenced and the numbers. So it's strange that even like a respected newspaper would still print numbers of a commercial platform that is banking on our fear of being left alone to validate somebody's cultural relevance. Um, so this is why I started like uh, using more dramatic means. So um, I wrote like a declaration of war against this principle on hyperallergic, and I started a Facebook army. And uh, what I did is like going through the process of not only acquiring the likes and acquiring the follows, but actually um, crafting these identities too. And I've had these identities based on the Hessian mercenaries that fought also in this vicinity um, for the British to avoid uh, American independence against the American Revolution. And this was particularly interesting because the money that was paid by the British to the Hessian mercenaries um, was later used to, buy, to purchase or to actually make possible the Friedrichianum, which is the first publicly accessible art museum in the world. And I thought that was actually, that was quite interesting. So I used all these identities from the 1870s to, uh, I sent them to people that were crafting these identities, so in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, and they were all uh, registered um, on Facebook. Um, 
So for example, Friedrich Baum or Caspar Bartholomé, Jan Baer, um, Axel Christian. So there were thousands of these and like the, the best response after a while I got because I had them infiltrate different kind of social groups. Um, so I asked different people to accept them as actual friends so they would pop up as also suggested friends in other vicinities. So people would get these really strange um, kind of alphabetically sorted friend requests of all these people that looked similar to each other uh, because they scraped the images that were uh, linked to each other or like from same sources. And of course, like my proudest moment was, and by now I think it becomes interesting because this was, well, one year for, before the election here. Um, this made it to the BBC, so I was happy that this was reported uh, on. But of course now we're in an era of this becoming so much more than reality. Um, and I think this becomes interesting now that this was, in essence, it was a research that was like, what is the materiality of this kind of quantified social capital? and speculating on potential political influence, and now this political influence is quite clear, and it, it's like abundantly reported on. But um, I still think it's interesting where the crossovers are with art, with quantifying audience, with faking audience, with faking reception, with um, you know, making work that would travel through a certain audience in a particular way, um, overlaps between propaganda and, and art, of course. So, the, the work that I'm showing right now currently in the focus section is um, based on the fact that I found the materiality of these accounts interesting because they're actually, a lot of these accounts are quite technical to, to craft. So not only do you have to have the images and the content and the name, but you also have to have a dedicated internet connection. Because if we would all start making new Facebook profiles on one connection, after a while, Facebook would detect that and that would be blocked. So you need dedicated internet connections. But you also, after a while, need a phone number because you need to verify the account to be an actual person that's tied to a phone number. So what happens when we needed thousands of accounts, what, need, what it was needed to make all the millions of fake accounts out there is all these phone numbers. Um, so it's actual and real phone numbers are quite important there. So I've been making works with the SIM cards that have actually been needed to make these, uh, all these accounts. And the SIM card is interesting because that's, a, you know, like it's a, an identity module, right? So it's like, um, in principle, it's like a, an identification module. So it is an identifier, but it carries a little bit of gold. And that's how I managed to obtain them because the gold that's in the chips um, is sold for speculative value of people trying to get the scrap metal and the scrap value out of these cards. Um, but then, of course, it also becomes politically interesting where these chips and these sims come from different countries. So right now, my research is also really much is also focusing on the fact that you can have somebody in India who is crafting for years an American profile to be able to sell an American Facebook profile for twenty to fifty dollars while their own Facebook profile as an Indian person might never become more worth more than 75 cents. So this is a strange idea of like what a cultural influence could be by way of a commercial platform is if you say that your labor is actually into spoofing another person's cultural attributes to become valuable that will be more valuable than your own will ever be. And I think this is interesting to see even like the, the you know, the different countries represented in these SIM cards where these number, where, you know, these services are registered. And of course, it's very tempting to, it was too tempting not to make an American flag, let's say it like that. Um, can we play this movie? Because this is, this is actually a poem that my current army has been leaving on, for example, the Instagram account of Customs Border Patrol, which uh, it says, marking down a deeper line well, actually, you can read a lot of this. See more longings than demands to exchange keys or shake some hands, come in hot and cross the pledge, not a border but a feathered edge. Proprietary technology left ajar, limits fade, viewed from afar, borders aligned with luxury, ease this quantified reality. So if you see, these are all different accounts that are 
in a strong cadence delivering my poem to an Instagram account, which I thought is, I think it's quite obscene that the Customs and Border Patrol has an Instagram account that they're seeking this validation of their audience with these quantified numbers. Well, I think it's actually, you know, to have a Customs Border Patrol is one thing, you know, I understand. And then there's like the political execution of the things that they have to do. But then to have an Instagram account to make that, to do the PR for that through this commercial platform, I think is, to me, was quite extreme. And then to also profile that you're bringing water bottles, plastic, quite polluting water bottles to Puerto Rico. Anyway. I thought that was an extreme image that I commented on. Um, so that's the work I'm doing with that now, and I'm trying to research like not only the value of these different constructed identities and how that reflects on what our identities are actually worth, um, but also the fact of like how to you know do maybe other types of gestures than just the political propaganda gestures uh, that you can do with this kind of uh, mass effect of of large groups of real or not real uh, people and accounts. So that's, that's an introduction and um, yeah. Uh, thanks for your attention for that. And, um, um, and I would like to, should I just introduce Matt? Because it's Matt Gertzen. And um, I think uh, I wanted to ask you to introduce yourself because you're now a you're an artist, but you're also a researcher at Data and Society. And Data and Society is, I think, maybe I could describe it as a think tank kind of-ish place, research, research institute here in New York. And I think you're particularly interested in a lot of these methods of influence campaigns and, and how they actually work. And um, I'm always kind of impressed with the amount of detail the research uh, unravels or the, the amount of um, uh, information um, that comes out of this research. So if you could just introduce what you were doing. Yes. Um, so yeah, my name is Matt. Um, nice to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of coming out of the art world in some ways, but I used to be a, a newspaper reporter for a while as well. Um, but most recently I've been working at a research institute here in New York called Data and Society, and we look at the uh, impact of data-driven technologies on society. So the name uh, is very uh, appropriate. Um, and I particularly work on a, an initiative called the Media Manipulation um, Initiative, and we basically look at the changing landscape of social media and how, um, you know, as it changes, it creates opportunity for people to kind of game media systems and use the sorts of techniques that Constant um, explores, um, often for less than noble purposes. Um, so I'm particularly, you know, as someone coming out of the art world, I, 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 um, my practice was also involved using a lot of the kind of uh, what I would call latent affordances of, of uh, social media technologies to create strange situations. So in one example, I um, made an advertising campaign that was designed to sell a three, like a, a hypothetical sculpture to an art collector um, using psychometric uh, profiling. So it basically, um, this ad campaign was designed to target only a single person. Um, so, the, and this, was the, this is the sort of um, um, techniques that became came to kind of public attention uh, during the two th 2016 U.S. presidential election. Um, but like I was seeing the artwork as kind of a way of um, bringing those issues to public attention sooner. And of course, it was such a strange uh, artwork that um, a lot of kind of clickbait news, article, news um, outlets would write about it and things like this. So kind of I saw it as kind of like inoculating people um, from, you know, looming threats to their attention. Um, and I see Constant's work as, um, as very much doing the same thing, where you can kind of draw attention to, to these, these things that are quite difficult to understand and maybe not that pleasant to think about, um, but kind of bring them to people's attention in a more playful manner um, that allows society to, to talk about them and, uh, and uh, think about what what can be done to to prevent these same techniques being used um, for 
uh, for less democratic or uh, entertaining purposes. Um, so in my research, I draw, you know, work by people like Constant helps me understand uh, kind of the materiality and the, the uh, back-end processes of how these things work, um, even as I, I try to draw attention to how they're being used in much more, um, um, much less apparent manners, um, because often journalists will, you know, take the bait of, of these trolls and write stories using, using these sorts of techniques as evidence um, where there is not actually uh, any, any truth to, to what has happened. So that's kind of a rambling um, uh, introduction to what I, to what I do. And um, yeah, and maybe we can have, have some kind of a conversation here now. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to add a couple of thoughts um, from history a little bit, just that, that, that your work constantly made me really think about, and also your research. Um, Matt, um, the commodification of identity that, that Constance's work centers around by way of social media profiles and everything we've heard um, really made me think about history. It made me think about Walter Benjamin um, when he, in the 1930s, um, talked about the transition of the artist into the rapid li rapidly commodifying social space uh, and the role of branding in terms of the observer. Um, and he said he sells his power, uh, the artist, of, of observation. He sells his power of observation, um, which is, you know, could be describing exactly the conundrum you just um, told us about. <clears throat> his detective-like sharp eye, so he sells the power of his observation and his detective-like sharp eye to the cause of his employers. The artist is the observer of the marketplace. His knowledge is akin to the occult science of industrial fluctuations. He is a spy for the capitalists on assignment in the realm of consumers. What he sells in the market is, therefore, himself. He is merchandise, the strolling commodity. And as Carlo Sanzani, talking about Benjamin, um, observed, like the commodity, he's someone abandoned in the crowd of consumers. So, I mean, I think the fact this was written in the 1930s is, uh, is, and these ideas were kind of being really thought about then is very interesting in relation to, um, to Constance's work and the situation um, we're in now. So now that um, we exist in a sort of parallel world of real space and digital space, um, not to be too binary, but does the role of the artist in digital space take on a new ethical responsibility? What's the responsibility of the artist uh, and an artist such as Constant to, to his audience, to us. There's a paradox in the fact that centralized social control of any kind needs a level of cooperation from the general population. And this cooperation, of course, we know in history has been effectively solicited through techniques such as denunciation uh, and propaganda, right from the Spanish Inquisition in the late 15th century to Romanov Russia in the 17th, Stalinist Soviet Union, the Third Reich in the 30s. And the effectiveness of this relied on a key factor, anonymity. And the effectiveness of anonymity relies on its basis in emotional, subjective, affect-driven behavior, which is precisely what Constant is, is also working with. The immediacy, accessibility, ubiquitousness, and visual seductiveness of digital space speeds up those triggers to the reptilian brain that were before digital space communicated in real life, from person to person, as well as through the popular press and the manipulation of language, information, images, and visual symbols. But the key to the instrument and instrumentalization of anonymity and affect to effect social control is ambiguity in, in guise of truth. And so that led me to think, when I was um, thinking about and reading about Constance's work, about truth. There's, a, there's an important distinction between the fact that truth is always relative and the manipulation, instrumentalization of that fact uh, for, um, as Matt was um, um, mentioning, um, less than, less than uh, um, positive means. So is the quest for truth one that we should just abandon altogether because it's an impossibility anyway. The, the assumption that truth is somehow real and there's such a thing even as um, a single reality is, of course, spurious. 
So, you know, this has been explored and um, um, capitalized on for centuries. I'm thinking also um, when, um, Matt, you talked about um, when we had our email exchange, Constant being a kind of reverse engineer, and that made me think about Stalin's um, appropriation of um, Yuri Oshela's phrase, the engineer, engin uh, writers, Soviet writers at the time in the 30s, as engineers of the human soul. Meaning the engineering of feeling and beliefs um, in, in, in a kind of um, a, a sort of perverse, warped form um, of using the audience as artistic material, which is something that you've, um, you're dealing with. And then at the beginning of the Third Reich, of course, in Germany, the surveillance of people, of the people, by the people, through denunciation was a highly effective strategy um, of undermining both individual and, and general social, social autonomy through mutual distrust. And through the mutual distrust really rapidly eroded um, any um, um, stable um, belief in what might constitute the truth. And the sheer volume of information received anon anonymously by the authorities uh, from its citizens, the unverifiable nature of most of it, just um, um, created a, a, a complete inability to control it. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the issue that, that, that Matt raised, you know, the idea of um, disinformation and misinformation, and how extremist ideas are being pushed whilst using ambiguity um, as, as, a, as a kind of key tool to disguise true intent. Uh, what, are we, what are we talking about when we think about the possibility of ethics and of constant operating, as, as Matt talks about, as a kind of ethical troll, um, using troll, uh, trolling techniques to re redirect and reveal and resist um, and critique um, these power structures. So what is the role of um, the ethical troll, of an artist like Constant? Is, is there a way in which there can be a kind of counter, uh, a counterpoint, a form of resistance um, to the commodification of identity? Is that even possible? Um, is this kind of reverse engineering possible? Maybe we can all talk about that. Constant, what do you think, what do you, Constant, what, do you, do you, would you uh, embrace that label, you think? What, the ethical thro troll? Sure. Oh. <laughs> well, it's problematic because we've been, uh, we're like, like um, you know, for example, that you would, I mean, we've had these discussions before too, like in thinking about like if a counter narrative would survive, right? Like especially with this techniques of denunciation and if you would ever be able to really inject a counter narrative as this, like what a, count, like what a ethical troll would suggest that you would like troll, but like with maybe positive narratives, you know? That I never had the uh, thought that that would survive. Um, but it is true that there's like a kind of, um, um, I do feel some kind of responsibility of like people being, people's sense of community being gamed and you used against them or used against their interest, that I do, I, I think that's horrific. And I do, would like to share that with people that and find a common ground in that being horrific. Um, so in that sense, I do feel some kind of ethical responsibility and um, the trolling thing, I'm still trying to get over because certain people think that all my actions are trolly, and I think I'm really mean. Well, so yeah. What's what's the difference between? Sorry, Matt, did you want to? I was just thinking about the difference between you and as an observer versus you as interjecting into the structure. You know, because there is a difference between you observing it and critiquing it from yeah, so outside, and then you actually becoming part of it, which, which you are, and how, what's the tension between those two, those two things? To me, that's like, uh, I feel like I'm a participatory anthropologist. Like, I have to do it to be able to see how it works. Otherwise, I would have also never have found out that these SIM cards are such a crucial part of this whole chain of events. Um, but like even the considerations that are made, how to obtain data, like how to, the fact that I've recently just been offered to buy accounts that are a photo ID verified, that's an identity fraud, you know, but it just happens. And, um, you know, like I don't, you know, like, <laughs> it's weird, like I have to consider like, dude, this guy just offered that to me on like a very insecure channel, like, 
and how much like am I compromising anything by like or should I actually you know like the reporters or the people that I'm working with should I actually buy it and then let them know that this just happened you know so it, it becomes very uh, very tricky but it that kind of understanding of the materiality I could only get by participa participating in the system. So the same as like previous projects I've done, like starting a hardware startup or like doing like working in that realm or like um, working as an OEM company or like, uh, I think these things are like, by actually doing it, you see what the actual material considerations are. And the same as like, I still make the, like the kind of analogy personally of like uh, somebody mixing their own paint. You know, like I don't think you know, like I can just commission that and not see what actually, you know, had to happen to get, give me that material. Same as like I wanted to see the factory where these computers were made, you know. So I think in that sense that there's a, you know, like I'm an observer, but I, I need to participate in order to observe. Yeah, it's interesting because there's several layers of of productivity we could understand is happening. Um, so if you took the example of um, you're using these sock puppet accounts to uh, write collective poetry on the U.S. border controls, uh, sorry, U.S. border patrol <clears throat> um, Instagram account, you know, on the one hand, you're understanding how how to coordinate a you know a uh, a collection of, of bots or sock puppet accounts or, or however that was, was managed. And then you can kind of share how that works. But on the other hand, you're also, you know, publicly demonstrating um, the, 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 the fact of this platform being compromised, right? So if someone was looking at that Instagram account, they would see that there are, you know, a hundred accounts that are clearly coordinated and then that might lead someone to the next thought, like, well, what other accounts uh, are, you know, compromised in this way, and what are they saying? Um, because I have taken for granted that usually these are real people, but clearly these are a hundred people who are part of a single thought, right? Um, so I find that's one thing I find really interesting is is the possibility not only to explore and to understand and and to learn, uh, and and then to share and to forward that understanding to researchers like myself, for example, but also the, the kind of performativity of the very thing that you are questioning, right? Um, and I think that's something that shouldn't be underlooked either. Yeah, actually, like, I have the, I have, I have the feeling, strong feeling myself, I've, I'm becoming a bot, as in, like, uh, I'm, I'm being, you know, like, I'm compromised to, you know, talk about certain things all the time. Anyway, but uh, that's more my, own ID identity crisis after controlling thousands of others, um, but I. Um, but it's also very strange to have this kind of type of conversation. In the meantime, for example, now uh, during the fair, so if somebody would post about my uh, work, uh, they automatically got like fifty thousand uh, Facebook or like Instagram likes, for example. But then, which was quite hilarious because also the the. The people from the fair were like, what? Your work went viral. Jeez, like, what happened? And it's like, but it was cool because I was like, I've recently become a, um, a bulk reseller. So I get have access to these kind of things. And I just like paid five cents for it. And it like happened. So I did it from the lounge here. And it was that kind of, it was fun. But it was also weird because I'm having this discussion. We're having, you know, we're kind of assuming kind of an awareness of these kind of that, that type of material and like how we all are being played as an audience and how our small participation as the person that leaves a comment once in a while can, can be completely drowned out by somebody with access to five cents of the right password and you know bombard another opinion over you um, and it's quite quite strange that it's like yeah we can assume this awareness but there's um, but it's not that common and it's also like that's what I think is interesting about what you're doing is that it's like kind of this research institute that is trying to actually get to concrete examples of what has happened and to actually prove this up but I really wonder like how uh, if you believe for example that that would will lead to a heightened awareness 
and potentially a change of behavior in how people perceive a potentially popular account on Instagram or you know how people read comments or if people you know double check if a comment might be made by a real person or yeah yeah so that's that's what we would con call like a media literacy approach you know which which is the idea that some of these problems will go away if if people are simply more educated about the practices and thus able to recognize them when they're happening but of course part of the problem in in the media environment now is that people you know information is extremely abundant and attention is ext extremely scarce so asking people to spend more time um, investigating fewer things uh, is a hard sell in many instances so I find you know I mean two things about what you said I mean one is you know trying to find concrete examples of things to share even if you're going to take the media literacy approach I mean that's why I had used the term reverse engineering because often it's more dif it's difficult to to prove with certainty that a problem has happened um, on in the online space especially so they call that the attribution problem in computer security um, but then to be able to show that you know by pointing to a, a project like yours which is transparent and being able to show that this is possible this person has done it then you don't necessarily need to prove that it has happened in another instance is perhaps enough for someone to understand that it is possible but then I'm also very what I find very interesting about your work is the is the potential for the for these techniques to be used in a, in more proactive ways so for example in your in your you know purchasing of of likes um, for Instagram followers uh, you know part of the reason likes are or are, are follows on Instagram are, are um, seen as valuable are because people ascribe value to them right so if the New York Times attest to someone's value by uh, telling you how many followers they have that only works if ever if there is a asymmetry in the amount of followers people have right so potentially you could use these same techniques to to kind of perform a, a, a scorched earth campaign on the whole reputational economy by flattening everyone out to uh, to zero right and 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 really breaking down hierarchies that way which could be a very powerful gesture not just a critique and very expensive so that would require so this is interesting because that would it's I also think it's fascinating that like you're quoting St Stalin or like you're mentioning you're talking about scorched earth I've been previously been named the Lenin of social media because I injected false capital to equal equalize people anyway but uh, it does require like a state power to be able to do so. So this is also the interesting part, like would you require a state responsibility to do so? And for example, if you have an infrastructure that sells attention of your citizens to the highest bidder, then you know, is it your government that's responsible f for allowing you know, any random other state to be able to buy up that attention? You, know, you put it up for sale, so why are you complaining that like another state bought it? So I think this is, it's, it's interesting that like, for example, performing such a scorched earth campaign would require s state power because you're actually programming, like now with my experience, I, don't, I know it's very hard to remove accounts because all these bots have always been written to only follow people, not necessarily to unfollow people. Anyway, but uh, so that means it's easier to add people than to remove people. So then we would have to equalize everyone. Um, but yeah, and that was already, at that time I paid $5,000 for two and a half million um, follows. So yeah, dollars for follows. And then uh, now that would be cheaper because I have a different position in that hierarchy. But <laughs> I do, anyway, but I, 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 I think it's interesting that it can be exemplatory and that for example, doing these kind of more uh, symbolic uh, gestural uh, or these symbolic gestures that that can reveal some data and it can reveal people how, uh, to people how, how the system works. Um, but it is also interesting that that, like I don't want that to just be my main purpose, you know, not only to like, see this is like behind the curtain, this is how it functions. Um, I also really enjoy when it becomes poetic that you see all these multiple identities speaking as one and that that becomes like a choir or um, and also, for example, I found it problematic because a lot of the times technical solutions would be 
to verify, ver have a stronger verification of legal identity. So, for example, when I was in China, and I tried to go on the social media, this was 2012 already, tried to go on social media there, I had to get like a social security, local social security number. I didn't have one, so I asked a friend and asked like what was the birth date and what is like a geospecific code, and I just changed these codes to like other regions and other dates, and then I got onto the platform. But it was weird because it meant that you you know, you tie your actual legal identity to your online identity. And that's, that would be, to me, detrimental if that would happen, and that would be a solution. You know, like, I think there's a poetic justice to be able to have multiple identities, to be able to be, you know, like Christopher Poole of 4chan said it beautifully, like, identity is multifaceted as a diamond. I'm a different person than a, a, as a husband, than a neighbor, as a son, than a friend. And I think that this is still, you know, like, I still think it's beautiful to be able to have multiple identities. So in that, in this gesture of like having, you know, carrying all these fake ghosts with you when you're doing something, is something uh, I still appreciate. But, yeah. Well, you, you're talking also about the relationship between public and private, and 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 elite versus democratic. And in terms of multiple identities, I mean, some people have a, a kind of public Instagram account and a private one, meaning one that only only a small group of friends knows about and they kind of already operate multiple Instagram accounts, but only a few people know that. But in terms of public and private, I think it's interesting that, that several artists I know have deleted their social media accounts. So they deleted Instagram, they deleted Facebook, other people I know delete them, bring them back, and they, you know, it's almost as, as a way of, of kind of controlling their own responses as well as people's access to them. Uh, and when you talked about this reflecting um, a, a kind of fear of being alone. What you're talking about as well when you say that is our relationship to community. <clears throat> and in terms of the artistic community, you know, there, there is a very strong arti uh, artistic community. Um, communities plural. Th that already exists in, re in real life. And so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a difference between the artistic community the broad one we all inhabit, the, the many communities within that, um, the, the, the online community, <clears throat> and then the relationship, how we manage our public and private lives and where those, where those interconnect. The, the fact that somebody would care about how many Instagram followers they have, for example, with this project, is, is you know, it's tapping into not only loneliness, but, but a question of identity. Um, and how you construct your identity, and how how the um, your relationship to um, what constitutes taste in a way in contemporary art is is kind of thrown into sharp relief by what you're doing, because contemporary art is not an exact science. It's 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 a completely subjective, emotionally driven, affective environment and. It, 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 it's like it's like the market, um, it's like Wall Street, and it's because it's so subjective. Because especially in this day and age, there's no such thing as you know the one. It's not a pyramid anymore with best at the top and you know the A, B, and C list. It's 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 a matrix. It's a completely flat matrix, and the art fair is a very um, or the art fairs plural the, f the five plus that are on right now and there's more in May are, are a very clear um, demonstration of that. So, you know, what it, it, it's interesting that that this anxiety may also be the result of the the the, the lack of a clear agreed. Um, definition of what constitutes taste, good taste, excellent art, quality. You know, this is it, the, the extreme democracy of, of, the, uh, of the internet is sort of colliding with the elitism of the art world. And so I think that you're also talking ab about, about that, you know, that some people actively don't want to. I mean, I get the least likes on Instagram when I post Michelangelo, you know. And so, the, you know, it's, it's, what does it mean? You're, you're, you, one, it, it, it's people at their most um, subjective, their most affective. And so I think that what you're touching on also is the way in which contemporary art is impossible 
um, to define in terms of how we value it. And so you're almost creating another sort of value system that, that talks about that, that issue. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add on to that, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things about this style of art is also the way it doesn't necessarily need um, an institution or even a, fra a, a frame or an interpretation to, to, to pr function in, in the world and do things. But it also can have that as well, right? Like it's, it's, um, it has, it's very multifaceted. And I'm actually very curious to hear your thoughts on that as, as someone you know, who works through an institutional lens in relation to, to this sort of work. I'm, I'm very curious. Well, I think, I think you know, subjectivity is, is, is at the heart of art history. History, there's never one history. History is constantly, and art history is constantly being rewritten. That's the whole point. It's not static. Um, and so, therefore, I think that the, the, the framework of, say, a museum, um, as a, a museum is fundamentally a scholarly institution, a, a, an archive, a culture, an archive of, of, of culture. And um, in, in, in writing the history of that archive, or the history is plural, the, the group of people who come together at any one time in determining um, how that, um, that, that history is written is in constant flux. And within that, the, the discussions the group has are in constant um, development and flux. There's never a fixed point. Um, there's never a fixed um, idea of what history or art history is. Therefore, it's, it's a framework. And it's a framework that is not driven by commercial um, um, commercial uh, interest because it's not a business and if something enters the archive that's it it doesn't it's its value is irrelevant because it doesn't go anywhere it, it's not for resale therefore you know there is a there is an inbuilt subjectivity clearly to 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 any human action including that of art historians curators museums but it's it's always framed by the the, the changes that occur. So if, if you look at any institution over any period of time, it's the accumulation of the history of that institution and the relationship of that institution to artists and to the, the broader cultural sphere and the political and economic situation, um, the geographical location, the international and global dialogue between the people who work there. And so there is an ethical responsibility one has working in an institution to acknowledge one's subjectivity, to interrogate it, to interrogate it with each other, and to also know that you're going to move on, everyone's going to forget your work, and it's just, you know, another group of people are going to take your place and take it in a completely different direction. And, and so you're placing a lot of things in the archive for other people to ignore, misinterpret, reinterpret, um, represent, um, and your primary responsibility is to the artist and to, to history. I do think that there's a financial incentive to be part in a museum collection, though. And I don't think, I don't, yeah, I think there's a very strong financial incentive to be, have an artist, for example, um, you know, I think it's better for my work if I enter certain collections and wor my work gets more valuable if I'm in certain collections. So there is a financial, no, no I, 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 you know, I do think that the setup of that framework is meant differently, but I do think it's, it could be susceptible for influence from these kind of things. And a lot of these markets, including the art market, I think is very, it can be emotional and responding to audience retention or uh, attention let alone the artists themselves, can be very influenced by what was most successful in their practice. Um, but I also think that it's, you know, um, you would maybe want to acquire an audience before you can publish with, to that audience, make, you know, like you have to make the public before you make something public. And I think obtaining that kind of audience and crafting that audience, I think, is being part of people's practice, although, you know, like, um, um, but I think, I think also like the the analogy towards the political realm is interesting, where I I do think it's a very emotional realm, and the art market isn't an exact science, but uh, it is very responsive to emotional prompts, and especially like 
what people would like or a certain critical mass would like or how people respond or how people frame it and especially like institutions of magazines people critics or and I think and even like people's Instagrams like you know there are major players with very you know interesting and ins whatever like or there are being followed anyway but I think um, it's a beautiful analogy to the political realm because that you know also it also happens that if there's a large like a large audience so for example even the the fake demonstrations and like the fake protests of large groups of people going somewhere that could even be paid will still kind of get into the news, would still have an article written about it. It still seems to validate this particular opinion. The, the opinion could be very uh, niche uh, specific, but it could be rewarded by just adding certain paid infrastructure on top of that, which can be designed, which can be gamed uh, to be able to inch up on the ladder of attention. And I think that happens within the art world all the time. Um, and I'm, you know, like, I'm happy to be able to be in this position to do so, but it is that I'm, you know, that there are these steps within an institutional framework that I'm taking. And I do think that the, the political, like, to me, it was interesting to stage, for example, certain performances within the art world but to also reflect on like how that would happen if you would do that with politicians in a larger scale. And I think it's exactly how this stuff happens too. It's, you know, you find like a little, small little um, topic, you can blow it up by fit, like mechanically amplifying it. So like making sure that there's like, that people think as if it's widely discussed, as if it's popular, make it, you know, perform better in algorithms and rankings so that more people see it. Uh, creating discourse about it, making sure that people write about it, making sure that maybe more respected people write about it. And then, you know, after a while you have like a flat earth theory. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I find quite interesting is, uh, you know, if you look at people using similar techniques like this, I think mostly they're working for political campaigns or they're in the employ of states just trying agents of chaos or they're people who are motivated like trolls who are motivated just by the lulls as they call it uh, or you know a sense of kind of transgressive aggressive pleasure uh, just people making fake news for pure profit motives you know they can they can piggyback um, advertising ad tech uh, on on top of it um, and all of these people tend to be fairly inscrutable to the to the public, uh, sometimes by design, sometimes just because it's quite obscure what they're doing. Um, but then what I what I find interesting is you've you're doing this for a different kind of set of incentives, and and part of the you know part of the what what those incentives demand is some degree of accountability and transparency. And so it, it, it makes me think about, you know, the role that the art world can play as a staging platform for, you know, these kinds of experiments um, in into the popular psyche or whatever, in a way where they are not actually surreptitious or or um, you know, particularly Machiavellian because they are potentially available to scrutiny by the public as they are happening, and so they become the condition of understanding what is already happening elsewhere. And I'm just, I wonder about, you know, to what extent the art world is designed to encourage that kind of experimentation or to what extent its ability to incentivize that type of activity is, is just incidental uh, to, to, you know, the, his, the history of how it's just, you know, just a, uh, a coincidence. I mean, I think it partly depends on where, which art world you're talking about. I mean, one thing that disturbs me about the art world is its elitism. It's very class-based, you know, and, and also in this country you have to pay to go into a museum, which is, you know, really problematic because it immediately cuts out half the population uh, who can't afford $20, $25 to come to a museum. It's a very elite activity, um, very middle-class activity, upper middle class. Um, and, and likewise, you know, we, we come back to, to, to primary school education, to secondary, secondary education, to, to, you know, the working class, which, which the majority of Americans are. Um, and, you know, the, the, they, they don't, 
you know, as Michelle Obama said when she opened the downtown Whitney, you know, I didn't think a museum was a place that I was allowed to go, that I was, that was for me, that was anything to do with my life. And, and you know, to break down those barriers is, is critical, and bar barriers of race, of in inclusivity, uh, gender, or, you know, ageism, all these things, um, uh, you know, the internet's not neutral, the art world isn't neutral, the museum isn't neutral. Certainly we're working at the Whitney to really address that, I mean, very seriously. And inclusivity is top, top of our agenda. And it's, it's it, you know, it, it, it's, it's so insidious. Uh, and so, you know, what are we talking about, you know, when, it, when we talk about audience? And um, in terms of the global audience, I mean, one of the, one of the, the differences between, um, you know, looking at, um, your work within the context of a museum or an art fair and looking at your work online is that online it's accessible pretty much for free except your access, well, well actually pretty much for free. And so, you know, what does global mean in relation to your work? You talked about this, this um, um, international kind of uh, market from which you drew the SIM cards, you know, it's such an international global um, economic and political situation, you know, the art world is not similarly global, except when it comes to the elite um, art market. So therefore, the, one, of the, one of the ways in, in which I think your work is very important is the way in which it cuts across that and creates a sort of democratic accessibility to ideas and to artistic practice, uh, which doesn't rely on on being able to pay twenty dollars or whatever, the, the, you could, it, it's very direct, um, unless maybe you're in China or a few other places. But you know, this is this to me is 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 a really um, critical part of of it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely when I was speaking earlier, I was thinking about the democratic access of the work, but of course, museums are often not accessible at all. Um, but it, but then it is, and then also of course there's the whole aspect of the political economy of how you how these uh, these um, these these like armies these bot armies or whatever are constructed, and that's something that you're that you're you're interested in interrogating as well as I understand, right? The the way that the the you know the reason these these a lot of these click farms are available is because of the global economic disparity between the global north and the global south, right? And yeah, but the, this is, it's so, okay, so now I want to do something a bit, little bit rude, but uh, Chris is in the audience who I did something with before in, uh, in, in January for a very a new museum. What, do you know the recent numbers for like what a daily active user on Facebook is generating for Facebook now? But like a US, US based da daily active user, or what was the number we used uh, early 2017? Per year. Yeah, so, and, so that's $60 per year per daily active user of an American Facebook user. Um, but a non US. Yeah. So a non-US becomes generic, like anything non-US. Where, you know, I tend to differentiate anything non-US to a very broad range of cultural attributes. But, <laughs> but then that becomes less than $10. So this was also, thanks, Chris, by the way. It's very nice to have the facts in the room. Um, but um, there's a... Um, uh, it's strange because it's, it seems like the American audience is set up to be gamed, right? Like it's set up to be gamed because the most money is being, that comes from there. So um, I think this is also, it is interesting like how it's all focused, like it seems like it's some, you know, like um, kind of, um, I don't know, like cultural imperialism almost by way of commercial, um, methods of like longing for a certain identity that would be able to generate that much money or that would be that valuable. Um, I also, yeah, anyway, so I think, I think that is interesting of like even studying how that works or like how these, these methods work besides the fact of like, you know, it, is in that kind of inclusivity is there too. Like, you know, like, is that, you know, like, I still think it's kind of extreme that somebody in India would be crafting 
profiles that would be you know, more valuable than their own profile would ever be worth. Um, these people also wouldn't have access to museums, they barely have access to food, but then they're still, you know, doing that. Uh, yeah, it's not. It doesn't take long to run into some very intractable problems when you're yeah. when you're thinking about the political economy of this stuff. Yeah, I do think to contradict myself that also museums can, um, apart from being elitist, they are also very critical, um, in a way, safe spaces for artistic ideas and cultural ideas to be framed within a, a kind of non-commercial, a, a sort of scholarly. Um, art historical context. Uh, and so I do think that the relationship between the museum and your work, for example, is critical, um, you know, that, it, that one shouldn't reduce it to binaries, as maybe I was mistakenly doing, in terms of, of, of location um, and context. Because I think that one of the usefulness, part of the usefulness of the museum is its um, um, ability to frame to frame culturally and to frame, you know, in terms of scholarship and art history, and and that that puts a, a lot of responsibility on the museum to um, maintain its integrity um, as a as a place of scholarship and reflection and you know um, a, a kind of context for this work that is that is based on things other than um, the, the kind of commercial. Um, albeit one might acquire a work for the museum and it may affect the market, but it doesn't, that doesn't affect us because we have no, you know, the less expensive the work is, <laughs> the more likely we are with our modest budgets to be able to acquire it. So, you know, we, we, it's, a, it's of no interest to us also as curators because we, we, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't, it, it, our integrity were completely compromised if we were to bring in a lot of sort of market-based work that really sits and has no cultural value beyond its immediate market moment, which is probably about five years, maybe 10 years um, maximum. So, you know, I think the museum as a place to explore and, and frame um, these ideas, also through things like conferences, discussions, online, etc., it is important, and I think in terms of communities and, and having a, a, a kind of context and a place for people also to go to, um, to, f to even find projects um, like this one is, is, imp is important. But do you, okay, so do you think that, the, like that kind of infrastructure could uh, inform or could be a safe haven against this kind of, you know, these kind of uh, bombardment of uh, um, disinformation campaigns that could be on multiple levels. It could just be political, it could be within the art world, it could be, you know, in all kinds of, with different intent. Um, because this, I keep thinking of the fact of like my, uh, my father died in 1994 and I would never be able to explain him this, all this stuff that I'm doing within an hour or like we would need days to explain like a phone and like all the added agency and whatever. But like he had an encyclopedia in his uh, room from 1953 that he just kept and was still using as reference. And uh, I just think it's so strange that like there's not, there's very little um, vestiges of, of this kind of reference material mm. left mm. of what isn't gamed or isn't potentially influenced or isn't like a Wikipedia that's being rewritten or like could just be edited like, you know, five minutes ago to say something um, purposeful. Anyway, so there's, I, I think this is, it is interesting that there's like, it is interesting where the web was, you know, was this kind of, for me, harbored this kind of punk attitude of do it yourself, publish yourself. Not only the revolution of being able to have access to information, but the revolution of publishing to, to an audience. Like I didn't have to, I remember like I didn't have to go to a newspaper to get my work in the newspaper. I could like publish it, right? Like and I could form a community and I was on Delicious and I formed like a bookmarking website and I formed this community that I'm still happy to be a part of today. Uh, but what I'm saying is like that revolution, that punky attitude, that self-made attitude now also became something that is almost threatening and like the kind of um, institutions that I was incredibly happy with to not be dependent on 
you know, become these kind of strange safe havens for this kind of cultural critique, where previously I had thought like this, like, you know, this was something that was slowing everything down because it would take, you know, a decade before something is recognized and then it needs to come into like a cultural canon and then, and it's always like slowing stuff down. So I don't know, I think this is interesting, like on a way like now where it seems like this discussion is focusing on like that being this kind of cultural safe haven. Well, previously I, I was definitely, and I partially still I am subscribing to the fact of being independent of that is very important to not only cater to, you know, framing your work in the proper way. So seeing it in the proper way, so like the correct people see it so you can get into this canon, um, yeah. I, I, that, that's a very important point, and I think as you were talking, one of my thoughts was, well, maybe in a museum one has to create a space for reflection and um, reading and going onto the internet that is very comfortable and that gives people the incentive to just really sit and be, because going to ex an exhibition is going, to go to an exhibition is to go for a walk. You are walking constantly like you are in an art fair, you're looking at objects, or if you're going into an installation, you look at the installation, you see it, and then you leave. But what about building into the museum what libraries were so often supposed to be about, which is, you know, you, you go to a library, and you sit in the library, and you read. Well, so many parts of the New York Public Library, so many um, locations of it, there's just three people in there. Um, and so libraries haven't, you know, they're wonderful archives, but they, you know, the, the space that, that doesn't really exist in a museum and doesn't really exist in a library that is not monetized, where you don't have to spend any money, where you can just sit comfortably and read and look at your work online and do these things. Maybe that's also, it comes down to something as pragmatic as creating, rethinking the way in which spaces are controlled and operated, and even the way museums are designed, um, and the way architecture encloses what you're talking about. Because in the end, we are we do exist in physical space, and I think that the ways in which those spaces are could, could be made more open to that form of thinking, as well as looking and sort of bringing those together, um, could also be important. Maybe we should open it up to some questions. We have like four from more the minutes. Two. Does anyone have questions or thoughts or things they want to say? We didn't cover identity politics yet and yeah. stuff, so. There's a microphone coming. Hi. I'm just wondering, how do you fund your projects? Like, where do you get your money from? Yeah, I'm from a, like, a um, um, so socialist democratic country where there's a government that thinks this kind of stuff is important. So I'm very happy to be from that country, which is called the Netherlands. And um, uh, that Part, funds a part of the research. Um, I'm also represented by a really cool gallery and that there's actually people also, you know, at this art fair that are supportive of this type of work, which I'm very happy with and proud of. Um, and the, so, for example, the army was made by commission in, uh, at Kunsthalle Frankfurt. And that was kind of interesting because that's also in Hessen, where the Hessian soldiers came from originally. The, yeah. So are you at, at a place uh, where you can reject money based on where it's coming from, if it doesn't fit in with your values? Um, it's kind of a hard question, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> kind of private. <laughs> uh, not right now. Not right now, okay. not right now sadly. Okay. Depends on how well yeah. Bitcoin is doing. Let me tell um, you that. How, does, how do you distinguish the um, real, or is there a possibility to distinguish the real followers and the fake followers? For you, for example, are you not interested in knowing who is really following me? I'm not, uh, I'm, um, I burnt myself on that. So, as in, like, I, I don't think I'm, um, okay, so for example, there's a really nice anecdote that happened because I bought custom comments, so like random, randomized comments for a picture that was in the fair here, for example. So, but like a lot of these random comments, so it was a picture of my work, but it also says, you're wearing a wonderful dress, or you're great in blue, or nice shoes. And then it was great because um, an actual person who I, 
who I don't know, but I knew it was an actual account, made the last comment and just said, nice shoes. <laughs> and it was great because it was like this meta experience and I was very happy with that. But also, a yeah, a freebie, exactly. But, <laughs> but there's a, that was a crazy laugh, amplified. Anyway, um, but there's, uh, I am doubting that I'm self, myself a bot, that I'm primed to do certain things in a certain way. Um, but, um, so in that sense, I'm not that particularly interested anymore. And also because the entire industry is just trying to make the perfect looking bot. So these bots that I've shown you earlier in the presentation don't, like the bots that are made now are just so much detail because for example, technical edition is now, you can sort images with machine learning, right? So you can recognize a face. So they download images and then they just put the faces with similar looking fit and then put that on an account and then it looks like it's one person, you know, so it looks way more authentic. And then, you know, like there's, you know, the detail of like that war of like how you can spoof an identity and how you can find a spoofed identity, that's going to detail where after a while it basically doesn't really matter anymore, you know. It will, I'm much more interested in the question, are we reaching the phase that we don't mind anymore that you know, identities around us are spoofed, our agents for other purposes, that we don't mind going, you know, through public space where people are selling us things and make it look like they're real people, you know. We have one, one, question. Uh, one final question. Hi. Uh, oh, wow, it's really loud. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was nice. I have a question. How much is a follower right now? Just one? Like through your reseller? Uh, well, there's a variation in price if they're from mm -hmm. Persia, yeah. Turkey, Russia. Uh, the cheapest? The cheapest is one thousandth of two cents. Okay. How many active followers on Instagram, you think? It's like half a billion or something? I don't know. Chris, do you know that? You got that, Chris? <laughs> active followers on Instagram? Active accounts. Maybe half a billion, something? Okay. okay, the question is, could you, with enough funding, just ruin Instagram forever for everyone by giving them like half a million followers? So then the attention game is over, so we can like move on and do something else with our attention? I think this entire industry has been trying to do it, and uh, it's been just working the benefit of Instagram because it yeah, makes it look as if they have more users, so they become a more valuable company. That's the unfortunate thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, nice that it went into technical detail. <laughs> Welcome. Constant, this has really been extremely um, informative and thought-provoking and also terrifying, um, the issues that are raised and a lot of, uh, a lot of food for thought. So thank you to Constance, thank you to Matt, and thank you all for coming.